Hello everyone. A warm welcome to the first low carb nutrition conference. I am Pramila Mundra, a low carb nutritionist from Bangalore, and it's a pleasure to host Dr. Noor Zeti from Malaysia today. Dr. Zeti, welcome to the first low carb conference. It's a great Thank pleasure to you. have you here. Thank you. I'm honored to be invited. Yeah. So before we go ahead, I would like to introduce you briefly for our viewers here. Dr. Colonel Noor Zeti Hamid is a family medicine physician with a Malaysian Armed Forces Health Services. She is a fellow and member of the Board of Examiners for the Academy of Family Medicine in Malaysia. She has been very passionate in the field of preventive and lifestyle medicine. She has been using low carb approaches on her clients in her practice very actively since 2018. And recently, she was accredited as the Metabolic Health Practitioner by the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners. Welcome again, doctor. And we would like to start the session by hearing, how did you actually know about low-carb approach? And what actually made you pursue it seriously? Mm, okay, it started in 2018. At that time, I just turned 40 years old. So uh, as a military personnel, uh, we have to go our routine um, medical checkup every year. Mm -hmm. So um, so I went for my medical checkup. At that time, I was 40 years old. And I realized that I was in a very bad shape. I mean, I'm overweight. Uh, I didn't get to lose all, the, all of the, my pregnancy weight that I gained the years before. So I thought that's a wake-up call and I, I need to do something about it. So as usual, we do the mainstream, like what we've been taught, which is yeah. eat less and move more. So I've been trying really hard exercising and doing calorie restriction. And I'm so miserable and hungry all the time. Yeah. So I remember, I remember I was so hungry that that there are, there are days that in my clinic that I have to ask my patient the same question again and again. Like I ask them, uh, what, what, uh, how can I help you today? And after that, I ask them again, how can I help you today? Because I was so hungry that I can't even function well. Mm. So I realized that this there must be something wrong with the advice. You know, I'm a doctor. I mean, I, I know that I'm motivated. I know that I know my sciences. I read all the clinical practice guidelines. And if I can't do it, I mean, how would I expect my patient to do it? And mm -hmm. I felt like I'm a hypocrite asking people to do things that I myself can't do. So I started to, I, I thought to myself that I should try other things. Let's try other things. Mm -hmm. Things that not in my medical textbook. So uh, actually, I first, I started to use uh, fasting before uh, uh, low carb. Okay. Before low carb, I started to do fasting first because I'm a Muslim, so I'm used to fasting. So I thought that this is easy. I mean, and I've, I have, I run a very busy clinic. So, um, you know, when you're busy with your patient, you don't really realize the time flies by. Yeah. So you can just fast like. No problem. And as I was fasting, I'm trying to find like um, what is the best nutrition to support my fasting so that I can fast longer and so that I won't uh, feel hungry. I mean, like I, I won't feel tired when I'm fasting. So that's the that's that is the time when I started to to bump into uh, low carbohydrate diet and keto diet, real food diet, or all those other diets that uh, help to support me to uh, become healthier and fast better so and as um at first i just use all the free resources you know like the, all the lectures from youtube and i buy books you know i started with uh, jason pang book and ben bigman and then um then i got better i lost i i think i lost 11 kilogram in three months and it's effortless Huge. It's, yeah. it's not, I'm, I don't feel hungry. I don't feel tired. It's so effortless. And one day, what, what get me is like, that's, that's one day, and you know, as you, as you get healthier, mm. your, your face will change. Your body will change. Right. And 
And one patient came to see me one day. I mean, he came to see me for follow-up. This is three, uh, his six monthly follow-up. And then he asked, he, I was standing in front of him and he asked me, I have an appointment with Dr. Zeti. Then I said, I'm Dr. Zeti, don't you remember me, sir? And I said, huh? you look so different, doctor. Oh, you, you look different. What, what do you mean I look different? Yeah, I almost didn't recognize you. You look so different. I mean, like in a good way. Right. And I, I was like, yeah, this thing is very powerful. I mean, it's not about just losing weight. It really changed you. It make you healthier. She said, you look, he said that you look younger. I almost didn't notice you. So then I was thinking, maybe I should give this a try to my patient. I mean, like, um, if, 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 even if they can't lose weight, if that makes them feel healthier, more energy, more, ed more ed energetic, or maybe make them look younger. I mean, like, who don't who don't want that, right? Everyone wants right. to be. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like that's that's an everyone wants to look younger and want to you know look slimmer and want to have lots of energy. So I start to do this to my patient, and then I start to experiment with my patient, and they love it, and they 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 keep asking me like, why didn't you tell us sooner? Why <laughs> didn't you tell this this uh, approach sooner, doctor? Why why now? I said I just I just learn about it myself so they I got better and better and but as soon as I start to use it on my patient I start to become a bit um in um, I feel inadequate because now I'm I'm using it on my patient I mean they are not some of them are not well so mm. I'm not sure like how aggressive I should go there mm. is it safe for me to uh, to stop their medication when they got better so at that point, I thought I need to have more training. I mean, like a formal training. So I start to look around for, for, for formal training. So I bumped into Nutrition Network. Nutrition Network. And they offered so many, as you all know here, they offered so many useful online courses. And I become obsessed with their courses. I mean, I, I keep buying and buying and buying <laughs> their courses and try to do as much as possible because yeah. all their courses actually um, uh, answer a lot of my uncertainties. The one that, you know, the, the things that you've been doing anyway with your patient, but sometimes you wonder why is it this way? They, yes. they offer the, yeah, they offer the explanation, the scientific basis. So it makes you feel safe as a doctor. Uh, and then, uh, two years later, I found out about uh, Society of Metabolic Health Practitioner. So I decided to go for their accreditation. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's about it. That's how I got into this. Wonderful. Very inspiring and lovely story, doctor. We are also curious to know whether other doctors in the community, uh, do you find them practicing low carb or anybody advising that? Yes. Um, I have my circle of friends also like, into this, I know oh. maybe personally around twenty of them over here That's in Malaysia. That's a huge number. Yeah. Yeah, but I think I think I personally think there's more. It's slowly penetrating the our oh. medical community, but maybe some are still skeptical. I mean, they don't want to like say it openly that I'm doing low carb, you know. Uh -huh. So they 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 are doing it, but they don't like label it as I'm doing low carb. Yeah. But why? If they are seeing the benefits, uh, is there any reason for the hesitancy? Because it's not the mainstream. So maybe some people are afraid that because it's not a mainstream, people think that you're weird or that you're doing some something that is different. Um, mm. Yes, different and not maybe not supported by evidence. Maybe maybe they feel that way. Yeah, because that those uh that's that's what I feel when I first started. Only when I found a, the community and I, I, I went into training, I, I feel confident to, to, um, to, to explain what I'm doing, you see? Right. Some, they're just doing it, but they, 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 they are not comfortable enough to explain it. So that's why I think they, they don't declare it uh, uh, as Maybe. open. Yeah. yeah. So what about the dietary guidelines in your country? How do you find it? Like, are they... Uh, optimal for the health requirements of your country or what do you think would you want it to change? Okay, um, just like other uh, mainstream dietary guidelines worldwide, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, therapeutic carbohydrate restriction is not 
is not clearly spelled in our CPG, in our clinical practice. Guide, it's not clearly, but they did say that you have to reduce, you know, carbohydrate for the diabetes, but it is not clearly spelled. And and in for Malaysia, um, I I noticed that the our clinical practice guideline for diabetes, they mention uh reducing carb is important, but yeah. by using a partial or total diet replacement, which means by using a uh, liquid diet or meal replacement. So that is like, um, um, they they don't really say that you do low carb by with the food with the natural food. They said low carb is possible with partial or total diet replacement, which I think even, even there's evidence to support this. I mean, I don't see it working in my practice mm -hmm. because meal replacement, is, number one, is very expensive and yes. it's not satisfying for us. I mean, can you imagine like taking liquids? I mean, where we, we don't chew, right? You just drink. So it's not right. satisfying for my and patient. And it's not sustainable I, for long. Yeah, it's not sustainable. Mm. And it's also culturally, it's not accepted. I yeah. mean, you cannot expect like someone else is eating and you are drinking mm. next to it. Uh, so uh, basically, that's that's the thing that they need to change. They need to, to say that low carb is possible even with a whole food diet. Whole food and a real food diet. You know, not just by meal replacement. So do you have a community working towards it or some um, uh, a sort of a organization who would like to push it through or uh, address it uh, aggressively to make this change happen? Yeah, we have, but because our number is small, so we are still, you know, finding our way. <laughs> yeah, hopefully with, you know, more collaboration with people from you know from the global yeah. like what like what we are doing now is really good because now they get to see that you know everyone is doing it all around the world is doing it we're not the odd ones that is doing it right and the because, results speak for themselves yeah and the results speak for themselves the mm. results speak for themselves right. I, I i myself nowadays i feel like when me and my friend who are practicing it they said that whenever we go somewhere people that look people are looking at what we eat <laughs> Okay, they're yeah, curious. But, yeah, they're curious. Mm -hmm. They're curious. Yeah, so there is a change happening, but it's gradual. Yeah. Yes. And what are the couple of myths, uh, the common myths you would say existing in your country related to healthy foods? I guess it's the same throughout the throughout the world. You know, like grains is important. Mm -hmm. You need grains. You need fiber. Oats is very important for your health. Like. Practically everyone with a cholesterol problem will are forcing themselves to eat oats. <laughs> but when <laughs> if if like most of my patients who are using a continuous glucose monitor, you know, the glucose yes. monitoring, yeah, yes. they found that oats is very bad for your for your sugar. I mean, like I don't know how oats get to become the the heart healthy breakfast. <laughs> it's yeah. not healthy at all. Very true. Yeah, and then and also we have uh in Malaysia we have this thinking that bread is better than rice. Mm. Uh when it's actually the same, both are cup, but somehow they, they feel that bread is <clears throat> better than rice. And in my opinion, uh, <coughs> I sorry, I, I would rather if my patient eat rice rather than bread. Because when they eat rice, I mean no Malaysian will eat rice on its own. You don't eat plain rice, you know. Yeah, you combine like, it with... Uh, yeah, we, we write with... Uh, we eat rice with side dishes, right? We eat with curry, we eat with vegetables, we eat protein, uh, chicken. We don't eat rice on its own. Right. And when when my patient eat rice, I can ask them to keep on pushing their proteins and their vegetables. Keep on pushing their protein. And, and it's, then it's very easy to reduce their rice. But when they eat bread or when they eat noodles or when they eat... um pasta the the protein is too little it's just like few pieces here and there so it's very hard to reduce because you'll be hungry right you cannot be eating True. like a quarter pasta <laughs> True. so they're going to be very hungry so in my patient i i encourage them to eat rice and side dish i know rice is still sugar is still but i feel that somehow for asian it's easier to do their low carb with rice on board. 
by uh, because I because we can, you know, like um, for example, like in India, you eat banana leaf, right? Banana leaf, you know, yes. banana leaf. You have rice and so many side dish, right? Side dishes, yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine in Malaysia we have like that? We also have the, like that kind of concept for Chinese food. We also have like that kind of concept for Malay food because the three main race in Malaysia is um, Malay, uh, Chinese, and Indian. So we have like that banana leaf concept for each and every uh, race. So our choice of side dish is immense. We have so many side dish. I can eat curry with some side, some Chinese side dish. And also, we have a lot of influence from, you know, Korean. Now, people are into Korean. Mm. Like, Korean also have a lot of side dish. Uh, Japanese and also the Arab food, they also have a lot of side dishes. So, when they eat rice and all these side dishes, they never get bored because there's so many of them. And they and they can eat, you know, it's, it's hard to eat, like, just chicken curry and lots of chicken. It's, it's hard. But if you can eat, like, a bit of chicken curry and a bit of, um, vegetables, vegetables uh, okra, and a bit of uh, uh, fish, uh, fried fish, it's, it's, it's easy for you to, to increase your protein. And when your protein is increased, it's very hard for you to overeat your rice. Very so true. They, yeah, so they, 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 they feel satiated. I, I always tell my patient, you eat your side dish until you're full. Until you feel satisfied, only then you touch your rice. Because you cannot, you cannot go. I mean, you cannot go beyond. Overeat, you know? yeah. Yeah, you cannot overeat. Yeah. And they feel satisfied because they don't feel deprived because they still get to eat their cup. Yeah, it's yeah. it's the strategy to get the proteins in first. Yes, get in the protein first, and we also hear about this thing called the, um, you know, recently there's this a study that shows that the food sequencing really helps. Yes. Food sequencing, say, where you eat a protein and vegetable first, and then only you eat your cup last, and then you, and you can see that um, uh, not only that it increase your satiety, it helps you to not overeat. You can also see that the blood sugar, blood sugar spike, yeah, it's very mm -hmm. stable because my patient who's been using this because I have a lot of patients who's been using a continuous glucose monitor. I can really see that when they are doing like that, their glucose um. Uh, stability. The the excursion mm. is very, yeah, yeah, it's much improved. So it's a win-win situation, and they can eat good food. They can eat good food, and they they feel yeah. happy. Yeah, yeah, that's the basis of uh, sustainability because you need to be happy with yes. what you're eating daily. Yes, there's no resistance whatsoever. Wonderful. I mean, like, and it also as a doctor, it's so much easier. To ask your patient to eat more. I mean, I keep asking my patient, eat more protein, eat more chicken, eat more meat, eat more uh, eggs. Rather yeah, which than is to totally say, opposite to the mainstream advice. Yeah, rather than I don't eat this, don't eat pasta, don't eat rice, don't eat, don't, don't eat. You know, it's, it's easier to tell people the what, positive, to, yeah. what to do rather than what not to do. Yeah. And cannot do that. Yeah, it's much easier. Even, even with children, right? It's much easier Agreed. to tell them what to do rather than don't, no, don't, don't. <laughs> it's, it's, so it helps with our rapport with our patient. Totally agree. It's more motivating and positive. Uh, yes. Way forward. Yes. So doctor, uh, what is the metabolic status you right now find in your country? And do you find any similarities when you compare Malaysia and India, the metabolic status uh, currently what's going on? I think, um, I mean, if you ask me about my country, like um, our last National Health Morbidity Survey is in 2019. Uh, mm. We have one expecting in 2023, but the result is not yet coming. So it, it should come out anytime soon because uh, the, the next one is in 2023. But the, um, the data that I have is from <clears throat> 2019. Okay. And one in five Malaysian, one in five Malaysian is actually diabetic. One in five, can you imagine? And that is about four million. One in five Malaysian is diabetic. And one in uh, three in ten is hypertensive. Three mm. in ten has hypertensive. And I think the most, um, the scariest of them all is 
one in two, which is half of Malaysian, is either overweight or obese. Yeah, so it's like an epidemic. Yeah. What and and it's also not surprising. Half of Malaysian have central obesity. One in two has uh central obesity, which is a uh, waist circumference more than ninety centimeter for male and eighty centimeter for for ladies. Hmm. So that is very very worrying. To the point that now my my patient my patient actually told me that when they lost weight, their um, their friends and families um are concerned, saying that they are too thin. Like, you're too thin. You're sick. Don't do this diet. It's not good for you. You're too thin. Because they are not... Whereas if you chart their, BM, their body mass index, they are right smack in the middle. I mean, they are, they are very normal. But because you see so many fat people now that yeah. if you are normal, you are thin. <laughs> Totally. Yeah. Being sick yeah. or being unhealthy is like a new normal now. Yeah, the new normal. So if yeah. you are if you have a normal BMI, you are actually you are considered malnourished or thin. True. If you have a normal BMI. Yeah. Uh, because many of us, many of us in Malaysia, we are we are either overweight or obese. So that's the sad truth. So I have a lot of patients who who's very concerned because like the family members are are not happy that they are losing weight. They said that they are, they are getting sick. I myself, people have been asking me whether I have cancer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> do you have cancer? Or do you have well, what is happening to you? Mm. Are you are you are you getting? Uh, do you have some form of illness? You know, a lot of my friends and they are doctors. Yes, I think it's a very common uh, phenomenon in India also. When they see you getting healthier and healthier, or uh, yeah. tall and leaner, they start discouraging you from the diet which you are doing yes. uh, probably because they themselves are not able to do it uh, that is also one of the reason uh, because it looks I, weird it, it's very weird to 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 lose weight after 40 years old you know like nearing menopause and you're, you're losing weight that's very weird like people don't see that true yeah very right very rightly put because people don't see that and they accept it that that is the natural way of progressing yes. That is the natural way. Yes. Yeah, and they don't know the alternatives or the solutions which is available yeah. with just a food or lifestyle change. Yeah, I have to tell them that no, my my body mass index is normal. I'm normal. I was fat before. Yes, <laughs> I was fat before. I was overweight before. Now I'm normal. <laughs> Nothing wrong with me. Inshallah. True. true. <laughs> totally agree. Yeah. So, doctor, do you have any interesting case specifically which you would like to share or any observation in your low-carb practice approach? Mm. Yeah, I was... Um, those, um, like what I mentioned just now, the the thing that I find... When, when I first started to do low-carb, uh, when I first learned about low-carb in, in, uh, five years ago, I didn't really... Uh, I myself quite skeptical that we can do this in, in Malaysia. Because yeah. as I said, we are the rice nation, right? We are the rice nation. I mean, like, how can I how can I ask my patient to stop eating rice? I mean, like, that's absurd. Okay. So uh, but but the funny thing now, I I that's why I, I, I feel that when my patient convert to real food, which is rice and the side dishes, it is much easier. Food. What they need to stop is all the processed food. All the food from the flour, the paratas, the chapati, the bread, the biscuits, the pasta. Those are the culprit. Because those food won't allow them to eat enough nutrition. Won't, won't allow them to eat um, uh, protein and vegetables. And also, you know, all the flour-based food will also impede with... We have, we have what we call anti-nutrient. Yes. So, yeah. So, it... it impedes with the absorption and it makes them full Correct. it makes them yeah. full like if you eat noodles you'll be full you don't have any more space for protein if you eat noodles uh, so, so so my my it's funny i thought rice is going to be a problem but actually it in my case rice is the savior because when i convert them to eat rice i, I this is what i noticed uh, my patient who is like more into rice and side dishes, 
they are better than the one who like to eat um uh, flour based food noodles um uh, all the all the you know all the packaged processed packaged food, food yeah packaged uh, packaged processed food yeah the, the, those are the people that is very hard to 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 pros to progress because they are hungry because all when they are not getting enough nutrition uh, the body is craving all the time yes the the balance of the ghrelin and the leptin is 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 not right, right. isn't it so mm. they, they cannot conquer their their hunger they cannot conquer their hunger and and in my patient who eat real food once this they, they can conquer their hunger when they so i i will keep asking them to eat more and more and more keep keep uh what i call nourishing their body i say don't care about the diet first just uh try to eat enough protein and vegetables just try to eat enough nutrition okay as soon as they their hunger is um uh they can tolerate their they can regulate their appetite better i will i will give them the option of uh, fasting One so more. when they do fasting so they can get more threshold for the carbohydrate I mean, they can eat more carbohydrate, isn't it? Because yes. they won't be eating the whole day. Yes. So they just have one meal. So relatively, they are not eating much. So they, tend, they can eat like a bit more. Yes. So uh, that kind of like balancing up. And because uh, fasting is very well um, acceptable in my country, because we have a majority of uh, uh, Malaysian are Muslim, even though we are multiracial, even the days we before... Uh, before fasting, before intermittent fasting, I mean, um, I have my non-Muslim friend fasting with us. So it's something that is not new. So it's very uh, culturally acceptable. It's very easy to ask people to fast in Malaysia. Really nice to hear you, doctor. Uh, I think we've got a couple of good insights on your approach. And it's actually uh, so good to know that it's working well and it's progressing towards yes. a better healthy lifestyle. I would like to now invite Shashikant Ayangar on the screen, please. Dr. Nozati, Dr. Nozati, thank you very much for accepting this invite. And uh, truly, you coming here has made this event global. So we wanted mm -hmm. this global perspective. As many flags we wanted to fly in our banners. And your personal story... Uh, your personal success plus you applying in patients something out of the world and uh, we wish that we will have a lot many doctors like you across the globe so that we fight this rising metabolic syndrome you are also my colleague from nutrition network you are the certified medical practitioner and i am the certified uh, coach plus both of us are mhp so i am the first one in india and probably you're the first one in malaysia also yeah i'm the first in malaysia <laughs> so, so 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 happy to have uh, my colleagues from from various organizations coming in and speaking for common cause. So from the bottom of my heart, I, I really thank you for this sharing. Your yeah, thank you for inviting me. Yeah. So thank, thank you, you, Dr. Nuzeti. And uh, tam namaste from India. Thank you. Yeah. Namaste. Yeah. So, so I would like to hand. Yeah. Well, next.